Dr. Adkins had always been brilliant. As an only child growing up in Ohio, he was smart enough to skip several grades. So he was always the youngest and the smallest in his class, the kid not chosen for the baseball team. They had a problem. He didn't fit him. As a matter of fact, the principal at the school, when she wanted to talk to me, she said, don't worry about them. They'll catch up with them in college. And that's what did it. He came into his own at Michigan. Adkins graduated from the University of Michigan and went on to Cornell University Medical School in New York. He loved the city so much, he never left, opening his own practice there in 1963. When he was in New York, honey, that was the end. He fell in love with New York. He always said, Mom, if I could make it in New York, I'd make it any place in the world. And Dr. Atkins did indeed make it. In fact, he started a diet revolution. I've lost 70 pounds to date. And I feel wonderful. I've never felt better in my life. Atkins based his diet on a process called ketosis the point at which the body runs out of carbohydrates and turns to fat as its energy source. Ketosis simply is the use of fat as the fuel, something that an overweight person is striving to do. Uh, what it is is the simplest way to go from point A, which is you would like to burn your fat, and point B, which is you're burning your fat. You're using it for fuel. How do you do that? Very simply. You take away the fuel that burns before fat burns. That fuel is carbohydrate. Once you've cut out essentially most of the carbohydrate for two days, you automatically switch over to mobilizing your fat. It becomes then the primary fuel source. But ketosis can have one side effect that is hard to ignore, bad breath. My breath now smells like that of a badger's. Sweet smell of ketones is considered bad breath, <laughs> or just sweet breath is a matter of opinion. It smells like money. Can we have a double steak? How do you like it? Uh, medium. And many doctors thought the Adkins diet would lead to even more severe problems for the heart, the kidneys, the bones. The main criticism, it's a diet that advocates foods that we should really be cutting down in our diet, the saturated fats, the animal products, and it doesn't emphasize the foods that we should be eating, which are the whole grains, fresh fruits, vegetables. Um, it's also not a lifestyle. It's a diet that's very, very restricted. I think the things that people are concerned about is because of the low amount of fiber, does it increase uh, cancer risk, for example. People are concerned about the effects of a high protein diet on kidney function. People are concerned because some of the nutritional deficiencies of the diet could in theory uh, lead to decreased bone health. But Dr. Atkins seemed to welcome challengers. He even hired skeptics. I told him in rather blunt terms that I really didn't agree with what he was saying and I didn't agree with his diet. Um, and I really didn't care if I got the job, so it, I was rather straightforward about my criticism. And surprisingly, he leaned over to the desk, put, folded his arms, and leaned over toward me and said, can you start work on Monday? Dr. Adkins was confident he could bring his new employee around. I remember having a conversation with him about four or five years later, reminding him of the interview. And he said, well, he said, I knew if I could convince you I was right, I could convince anybody that I was right. All diet fads run their course, and by the 1980s, Dr. Adkins and his low-carb plan had used up their 15 minutes of fame. Low-fat diets were all the craze, so bagels and pasta were in, red meat and cream were out. Though Atkins was now out of style, he still had a thriving medical practice. What always kept him going was the fact that he saw how his patients were getting better. And after all, he's a doctor, and that's why he got into medicine. It let him really concentrate on being a doctor and develop his skills. There's almost was nothing that he really couldn't treat and make a difference. But now, Atkins drifted even further from traditional medicine and into the world of alternative or complementary medicine. He became particularly interested in using vitamin supplements and nutrients along with diet in treating patients. He worked a lot in alternative medicine finding therapeutic doses of vitamins and minerals to replace the drugs 
that people were taking, achieving the same results that the drugs achieved without the toxicity that the drugs offered. Um, and he was a trailblazer. He began to do some studying. He went to conferences in Europe. He talked to a lot of doctors. And that's when he began to slowly adapt the use of nutrients to help with medical problems. So for him, he didn't see it as a really a low point because he was he was really getting very excited about expanding the tools that he can use to work with his patients. He believed that uh, first of all preventive medicine that you could prevent a lot of illness by having the correct lifestyle by giving your body what it needs enabling the body. I think humans can and should live uh, past a hundred on the average and many of us to 120 and uh, that can be done if we are in perfect nutritional health. So the supplements really have been shown in study after study uh, to extend one of the parameters or another that are involved in, in holding back the aging process. But Adkins' experiments with alternative treatment would lead him all the way to court and charges of quackery. For a brief time, his license was even suspended for treating a cancer patient with ozone. Though this would be the most serious case, Atkins was never a stranger to lawsuits. I mean, he had spent all of his pension money, everything, was spent on defending lawsuits. I mean, it was that bad. In public, Atkins always had his game face on. Behind the scenes, the constant criticism sometimes got to him. He would get a little quieter, kind of withdraw a little bit when the, when the attacks were too vehement. But he kind of would shake it off and then go on and plug away. He knew he was right. Well, his first reaction was to dismiss the critics. And he would say, well, they'll eventually catch on. They'll eventually know. Uh, but, but when some of, some of the responses toward Dr. Atkins was visceral and emotional, and that would annoy him. But the criticism didn't keep Atkins from keeping up with traditional medicine. Bob read a lot. Yet I never saw him read anything other than a medical journal. Wherever he went, he carried his little tote bag with his medical journals in it and spent his time reading journals. He always, always, always a magazine in his hand or a book in his hand or something. Always. Even when we went on vacation, he still would really read, take some medical journals with him. For Atkins, work was everything. Now in his 50s, he'd never even found the time to get married. But he was still hoping. He was always uh, telling my wife how he wanted to fall in love with, uh, uh, a, you know, that he missed love in his life. And I remember we bought him a dog and we put a big ribbon on it. We started hugging the dog and he started to cry. And he, uh, he was a very emotional type guy. Then, at age 57, he met a former Russian opera singer at a party. I met Dr. Radkins at the Bastille Day party in the Hamptons. So the sparks were flying right away. <laughs> Well, he was very good looking, very bright, and quite funny. They loved to play tennis together. He loved going to good restaurants and having great meals with good wine and being in Veronica's company. Well, we were practically an item from practically day one. <laughs> it took a while to get married because we were living together, but we didn't marry immediately. We were inseparable, basically, always inseparable. Besides Veronica and work, Dr. Atkins did have another love. Oh, he, he loved sports. He loved his Yankees and his Mets. He would not miss a game for these things. I mean, usually television, but he wouldn't miss it. He loved tennis. No matter what, he would go play tennis in the winter, in the summer, you name it, he'd be there. Both the doctor and his wife faithfully followed the Atkins diet. Well, breakfast he had usually an omelette and bacon and some sliced tomatoes and things like that. Uh, lunch he had a salad. And at night he would have a main course. We'd start with a big salad, green salad. And then it would be either chicken or fish or beef. I would watch him eat and watch him have breakfast because he would stay at my home and uh, help would make him bacon and eggs and with double orders of cheese. And, but uh, he would never cheat, uh, you know, never eat a bagel, never eat bread. And he was pretty religious on his diet. Still, even the king of low-carb eating could be tempted once in a while. Well, his big thing was ice cream. He loved ice cream. That was his great big love, but even then he wouldn't go overboard. 
he'd have a very silver little scoop of ice cream. But he never had a, a weight problem. He said he had a weight problem when he was a young man, and he said inside him there was a fat person that wanted to come out. Through the 80s, Dr. Atkins watched and discussed as Americans got bigger on a low-fat diet. Suddenly, this one diet fits all comes along, people buy it, they buy into the fallacy, and immediately, the next decade, the incidence of obesity is up to 33% of the population. So, 20 years after his first book, he decided to take his low-carb message to the people once again. Dr. Atkins' New Diet Revolution was published in 1992. It was a bestseller, and he would revise it several times throughout the decade. One of the things Bob always did was to learn from his experience. So as he learned more and more things, he wanted to refine the message that began with Diet Revolution. And that, I think, really began to get people to start to pay attention to, again that there, there could be another way. But the Atkins diet was infamous, and the medical establishment attacked it as vehemently in the 90s as they had when it had been all the rage in the 70s. It was uh, crucified uh, by anybody in conventional medical uh, nutritional establishment and by all the health and fitness magazines and by um, any, anybody who was at all connected with health and nutrition. Uh, just wanted to, to see this thing go away as fast as possible. I was horrified, as other nutritionists were, that this was, you know, becoming mass marketed again and that it could have some very serious implications. Adkins' response to the critics was to point to his hundreds, even thousands of patients who were both thinner and healthier on his diet. What kept him going was the patient coming into his room and telling him that he changed their life. He thought he was right, and he just kept going, even through the 80s and, well, the 70s, 80s, and 90s, where he took a lot of criticism, and it just, he used it as a challenge rather than get angry about it. He had a very intuitive sense that what he was doing was exactly correct, and expected all his patients to follow it to the T, and if they didn't, he would get discouraged. Atkins now recommended a vitamin regimen as part of his diet plan. And as always, he followed his own advice. Uh, anywhere from uh, 25 on a bad day to, to uh, 60 on a good day. I mean, it's, actually, it's the other way around. When I don't feel good, I take more. Atkins' medical practice had grown into a full-fledged clinic for complementary medicine. And in the 1980s, he had set up a small mail-order business to supply patients with the vitamins he thought they needed. The original distribution center was down in the basement of the Atkins Center. That's how it all started. Soon the company began experimenting with low carb products. Experimenting being the key word. The first nutrition bar, chocolate macadamia nut, was both low carb and low flavor. I can remember the first prototype bar that we all tasted and none of us could swallow it. It was that bad. There wasn't like a lot of macadamia nut food competition out there. You know, macadamia nuts don't have very much flavor. There was a lot of uh, taste problems with the first product. But you know what? It's still sold because there really wasn't anything else out there in the market that was like it. The driving force behind the company, now known as Atkins Nutritionals, was the doctor's own craving for tasty, low-carb food. <laughs> That's one of the reasons why I think Bob wanted some food products. It, it would give him something that, that would allow him to um, make it easier to stay on a lifestyle change, which is one of the things we all need to do. I know Bob was very excited about ice cream, and ice cream was a topic for quite a while. And that was apparently very hard to make because it took a long time before we had any ice cream. In these days when Atkins was still very much a radical operating on the fringe, working for him was something of an evangelical experience. Everyone who walked in there day in and day out early on um, was completely committed to this idea that uh, Dr. Atkins was right and pretty much everyone else was wrong. And that's how it started. And so the entire company emanated with his passion.